They were among the first to arrive that night. Matt Oldfield reported to the McCanns when he arrived around 9 o'clock that everything was quiet as he passed the McCann's apartment on the outside. About 9.05, Jerry got up from the table to make the first check on his own children. He went into the apartment through the back patio door, which was unlocked and went to the bedroom door and had what he described as one of those proud father moments. Looking in at his sleeping children and thinking how lucky he was. At 9.25, Kate was about to leave to check herself when Matt Oldfield offered to check for her. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science. This is the first episode in a 10 part series debunking a lot of the claims and the sort of PR apologia narrative that is the um, popular Netflix series The Disappearance of Madeleine McCann. As a professional author and storyteller, I'm fascinated by the whole process of trying to prove, almost like a court case, trying to prove um, a particular case, a particular reality. And um, what's sometimes even more fascinating is how um, something that uh, is arguably not true can be, well, I won't say proved, but can be demonstrated, can be argued can be put in place and um, just how powerful PR is in putting a bogus narrative into the public um, headspace. So if the truth can set you free, so can very good PR. Just a little backstory in terms of my um, uh, involvement, expertise, um, you know, relevance, I guess, to the Madeleine McCann case. I've written four books on the Madeleine McCann case, the Doubt Trilogy. Um, the first Doubt book of mine has about 47 reviews. Um, it's only available on Amazon Kindle. Um, the Kindle book went to number two on the UK bestseller charts on the 10-year anniversary. For quite a long time, it was um, above Kate McCann's book the same year. Uh, I then wrote um, Doubt 2 and Doubt 3, and both books also then really went, I I'm not sure if they went to the the top, but they, they certainly did also um, uh, frog leap Kate McCann's book for, for a while. Um, I then uh, followed that trilogy up with um, a book called Deep Into Darkness, and um, that uh, that book kind of deals to some extent with the narratives of the Tapas 7 and that's why I've played the um, audio clip, the one minute audio clip at the beginning of this episode where you hear um, the voice of Robin Swan, the co-author of Looking for Madeline. Now the disappearance of Madeline McCann is largely based on um, looking for Madeline, and it's also often narrated by one or both of the co-authors. Uh, the other author being Anthony Summers. You hear his voice sort of towards the end of that minute-long clip. Um, again, what's fascinating to me is um, you have a £20 million documentary based on a narrative that's one of the least popular on Amazon. Uh, I think at the moment it's... Um, ranked 2.7 stars out of five. Um, I think it's got over 100 reviews, um, but it's 2.7 out of five is, is quite a low ranking. Um, a lot of people that 
disagree with my version. I've sort of hated on my book, but I still have a 3.1 rating for doubt. And um, as the books go on, the rating goes higher. Uh, a lot of the reason that I, um, I think that my, my narrative attracted a bit of vitriol is I used a narrative device to tell my story. Um, it's the first time a book um, on the particular angle that, that I took has actually been um, published successfully on Amazon and it was necessary to use this narrative device, um, The Raven, for this reason. Some people either didn't understand why I was using it or pretended they didn't understand. So I guess that's a bit of my backstory. Something else I can tell you is that in May last year, May 2019, uh, I actually traveled to Portugal. I spent 10 days um, running around Pride de Luz, um, talking to people and um, taking photos, uh, taking some measurements, uh, timing certain routes, etc. Um, I'm not going to go into that right now, but just to let you know that some of the images that you're going to see are images taken um, by me um, in Pride de Luge. Uh, I also have some background as a um, photojournalist and an investigative writer, um, kind of as a magazine journalist. So some of the photography you're going to see is, um, you know, print, print, um, print media quality. And so I think without any further ado, let's get um, into the review of episode one. If you think you're going to find this analysis interesting, then uh, please subscribe to the channel, like, share, leave a comment. And you can also read uh, the analysis on the Crime Rocket blog under the McCann tab. That'll take you to a lot of the, um, the links th that I'm going to be referring to. And um, just if you want to have a concrete source for the, the things that I'm referring to. So interestingly, The Guardian uh, gave the new Netflix documentary a one star rating. Uh, and this was around about March 2019. So it was essentially a month and a half before I traveled to Pride de Luge. Um, this Netflix documentary was very much in the um, minds of the, the McCann case followers. I know it was, there were a lot of people tweeting about it, but it was quite interesting that The Guardian um, described it as a blatant cash in and a rehash. Um, the interesting aspect about the cash in was just the fact that the documentary had been so expensive. I mean, it's a really expensive documentary at 20 million pounds. Um, but I'm not sure that that's all it was, um, you know, trying to make money or a rehash, especially since by the end of the same article, the reporter's sympathies are clearly with the McCanns. In fact, the Netflix documentary isn't simply a rehash, even if it does a lot of rehashing. Much of the rehashing purports a particular narrative. True Crime Rocket Science regards that narrative as bogus, specifically the sex trafficking spiel, which indirectly resurrects the little girl into imputed sexual slavery. But to dismiss the entire documentary as a greedy, thoughtless cash grab is simplistic and false as well. The documentary has a sly intent, which is to gradually manipulate audiences and plant the seed that somewhere out there, Madeline is moving around and living out her life, and that there is always hope. This pitch starts from the very first frame, and the very false and the first false facts, broken shutters and so on, uh, follow in short shrift shortly thereafter. And now we're going to go into um, about 15 general observations from episode one. Beneath the truth. I must say I find the title very ironic, um, that the title purports to be um, a search for the truth beneath the truth. Um, and it reminds me of the current uh, apology going on with John Bernay Ramsey, uh, hunting John Bernay's killer. So, you know, we're going to hunt John Bernay's killer. Uh, we're going to turn our backs on the police investigation and we're going to go hunting for John Bernay's killer 
somewhere else, you know, just in, in the whole conspiracy theory area. You have exactly the same thing with the McCann thing, which is we're going to go hunting for Madeleine McCann's abductor, but we're not going to look at um, the um, the police investigation and what the police themselves in Pride Deluge were sort of preoccupied with. And so this whole thing of um, the truth beneath the truth is kind of a joke. So I was quite intrigued by how this documentary opened. Um, you know, again, as a narrator, I've got to visualize a strong start, a strong opening, a compelling, um, you know, start to a story that's been told so many times in different books all over the media. Where does one begin? And so how the documentary series begins is with aerial drone footage um, giving quite a refreshing spatial context to the greater crime scene of Pride Deluge. I don't think I'd ever really seen the Ocean Club um, sort of from that particular angle. And actually what you're seeing there isn't the Ocean Club. You're sort of seeing um, kind of a building in front of it. Um, I've walked down that road, um, so I know how that sort of building actually obstructs the view of the Ocean Club that's, um, as you're looking at the picture, sort of more to the right. The, um, the Baptista supermarket is basically directly below that sort of monstrosity of apartments uh, and kind of to the right, right, as you're looking at the image. And then the Ocean Club is... Um, behind the not only that monstrosity but also the the supermarket also to your right um, kind of going in a sort of uphill um, trajectory number two um, okay so let me just f finish the first point um, so what's a little bit I guess disconcerting about that opening scene is you, you feel a little bit disconcerted you're not quite sure where you are what you're looking at and I think that's intentional. You, 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 you're supposed to be a little bit confused and the documentary is now going to educate you and, and show you kind of what's going on. Um, one of the opening sounds, ironically, given the use of the raven motif that are used in doubt, is the cawing of birds over the Ocean Club crime scene. So, again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, I took a lot of flack for using a particular... Um, device, narrative device. As I say, a lot of people either couldn't understand why I did it or pretended that they couldn't understand. Um, I think a lot of people very cynically uh, took something that I needed to use and pretended that it was a valid criticism uh, when it was actually the opposite. It was quite a, I think, a clever tool to tell a difficult story. Um, and so, yeah, it was just interesting for me that the, the very first moment when this 20 million documentary opens is with kind of the sound, like an aerial shot with, with the sound of a bird crying. Um, and uh, just personally, as a, as a storyteller, as someone who's, who wrote that trilogy, um, it felt kind of um, like a... Um, maybe indirect, I don't think it was done purposefully by the producers, but it, it felt like a, um, in the narrative sense, a little bit of a pat on the back because I know when I wrote the Doubt series, I did want to not be constrained by um, time and space. I wanted to be able to write a narrative that could, could um, walk through walls and travel through time, and, and so that's what I did. Okay, so enough about that. Uh, on to point number two. A random family with children is seemingly selected to voyeur through the sights and sounds of prior deluge. This is how the um, first episode sort of progresses. You sort of see this um, scene and then suddenly you're on the beach with kind of a random family. And they're sort of telling you what it's like to be there, um, you know, to get a feel for what it was like when the McCanns were holidaying in May uh, 2007. I was in Pride Deluge in May um, last year, so 12 years after the fact. Um, some things have changed. You know, looking back at the crime scene photos, looking, at, looking back at the photos the media took 
some things have certainly changed. The, the town has developed somewhat, but not that much has changed. Um, a lot, a lot is still there. The church is still there. The Ocean Club looks very similar, basically, to the way that it looked. The supermarket is still there. The way the beach is, you know, the, the whole setting is basically um, the same. Um, there are probably more cultural differences that have changed since then. Just the um, the fabric of society, I think, there has been torn to some extent by by this crime. And uh, and, it, and it, its effects linger. Um, so in any event, the family featured in the documentary happened to be in Luz when the incident around Madeleine McCann occurred as well. Number three, despite Jerry and Kate not participating in the documentary, within the first few minutes we see familiar footage of their faces. The very first view of Jerry is very early on where he's doing his rounds as a respectable doctor in a hospital in Leicester. And that's kind of a um, very important point to make very early on, which is this situation, this very high profile criminal case is very, very unusual in that you don't just have one well-to-do doctor, you have two. And in a sense, that's the strongest I don't want to say alibi, but it's it's kind of the strongest aspect in the McCann's pocket is that they are respectable doctors. And I've written quite extensively about this, but if you have to ask yourself, um, who is more credible in society? Who is more trustworthy in society? Who is given more social kudos in society? Who is, hierarch who is high in the social hierarchy? Doctors or policemen? So if a doctor says something, what value does it have in compared to a, a policeman saying something? And and that kind of sums up the whole McCann case in a nutshell. Number four, the sympathy narrative is also established early on with a woman's voice intoning about how the couple were desperate to have children, finally resorting to in vitro fertilization. At this stage, it's not made explicit that actually Madeline had two siblings at the time and both were present in the same apartment bedroom when she was, in inverted commas, abducted. It should also be noted that post-abduction, none of the younger children woke up in spite of a chaotic cacophony playing out around them. And this kind of has a parallel with Burke Ramsey in the John Bernay Ramsey case where the one child has been kidnapped and... Ultimately, it turns out she's dead and, you know, it's a devastating thing to happen to your sibling. And yet, Burke Ramsey just seems completely fine. He's not worried. He's not crying. Even days later, he's also not worried and crying and he just wants to get on with his life and he's just happy to play computer games. So he's not traumatized by what's going on. And both the Ramseys and the McCanns kind of share a thing where the public kind of looking at them constantly in the media were wondering why aren't they more heartbroken like wh where are the actual tears that they kind of making the right sounds but but are they where's the actual grief and that that was something that that that, that both um, cases kind of have in common um, whether you believe the families or not people were sort of wondering why um there was so much publicity and and so little grief on display. And both families were taken to task in the media about this. And then later on, you did see grief, um, you know, after it, after it was brought up or you saw what appeared to be grief. Um, it should be also noted that post-abduction, um, as I said, none of the younger children woke up despite the cacophony playing around them. So there literally was a cacophony in both the Ramsey case and the um, McCann case. In the McCann case, you literally had a stampede of hotel guests um, running through the you know, apartment 5A and two little children, you know, I think they were like a year and a half um, of age, simply slept through it all. And um, in the... Ramsey case, you also had a cacophony of 
police officers, several, I think at one stage it was four or five, literally running through the house, um, shining a torch. And in the Dr. Phil interview, Burke says, you know, someone shone a torch in his in his bedroom and he just continued lying there and um, preferred not to think anything was wrong. Uh, the idea of the children being sedated is not new, and I'll pro provide a link that you can follow to, to go into that. Um, although some stories about rows and sedatives have since been removed online. But will it be mentioned in other episodes of this definitive documentary? So in other words, early on, I'm just asking, you know, is this um, documentary going to talk about the drugging aspect. You know, we've talked about the McCanns being doctors. Is there going to be any talk about children being sedated? And uh, I provided a link from um, a blog that just references this moment where, where Kate kind of seemed to be very concerned about her two children that, that were sleeping so soundly while Madeline was missing. So, so Kate wasn't sort of running around outside looking for Madeline. She was trying to make sure that her um, surviving children were okay. And um, this was something that, that others noticed as well. Um, point number five. A pair of journalists are also selected who know the story inside out, uh, but initially they're not identified. This is in terms of the documentary. So you've, you've also got journalists. So, so far you've got two authors, um, and now you've got some journalists also who are sort of going to be narrating the story, and, and they're going to kind of be there for the long haul. Um, but it's kind of important to know who they are. You know, what are, what are these journalists' track record? What have they been saying all along? Um, you know, is it journalists from both sides of the fence or is it just journalists that subscribe to the abductor story? And um, it's not going to be much of a surprise which side of the fence they are, but we'll get to that. Number six, we're told ahead of time that this case is a confusing jumble and a lot of different faces are quickly implied as suspects a Russian, a neighbor, etc. They're basically kind of providing the scenario of who could it be? You know, it, this is just so confusing. Um, and we're going to provide you guys with guidance. Um, of course, nowhere in that jumble of suspects do they sort of refer to the obvious suspects at the time. Number seven, Kate McCann's voice provides voiceover as the camera pans over prior deluge. She sounds like a normal mother who wanted to have a nice, fun holiday with her children. Uh, they can have fun separately, and so can the adults somewhere else. And, uh, you know, when I was in, uh, in Luge, um, I didn't see very many children when I was there. Something else that I experienced when I was there was that the topography is quite arduous. So even if you're walking 50 meters or 100 meters, uh, it doesn't really matter where you're going. Um, it's, it tends to be quite a um, steep, arduous sort of walk. It, you know, you, you're invariably walking kind of steeply uphill or steeply downhill. And it's quite tough for a relatively fit person. I can imagine it being quite a lot tougher when you've got um, one child to sort of ferry across these sort of ups and downs, uh, but even more so with very young children, let alone three very young children. So I think that aspect made it kind of um, uh, problematic and kind of tiring. You know, you're going somewhere on holiday and, and, and the topography is immediately kind of challenging. It's difficult to get from A to B. You want to go to the beach, but it's a steep downhill to get to the beach and it's a steep uphill to get back. And the um, Ocean Club is, for an adult, it's not that far from the beach. It's sort of a um, five-minute jog, I guess, to the beach. 
um, or, or five minute um, brisk walk. But if you've got children, uh, that can easily become a 10 to 20 minute walk with little little children that maybe don't want to be held the whole time or something like that. And also even longer coming back. Uh, number eight, there's a nice little clip of the kids heading up the stairs onto the plane, which is from old grainy cell phone footage. When Madeline stumbles, a voice can be heard saying kindly and protectively, oopsie daisy. Is it Jerry's voice? Well, neither parents are anywhere in sight during this footage. But what is interesting is um, when you zoom in on this image, you can see it's copyrighted by the McCann family. And so you immediately getting the sense that in order for Netflix to make this documentary, that they had to get footage from somewhere. And as the documentary goes on, you, you start noticing that, that they had to be getting a lot of it from the McCanns themselves. And so you often have this with, um, with when you have apologia, you have this incredibly exclusive access to um, the, in this case, the, the, the family, the parents, and they give you this um, really, um, you know, quality um, insights, you know, whether it's photos, whether it's coverage on themselves, whether it's, you know, kind of, di kind of direct insights. But when there's someone who is kind of pointing a finger at them, then you get none of that. And they then, you know, people who are, accusing um, the parents in the Ramsey case and in, and in the McCann case, they, they kind of don't have any access to those kind of materials. And it, once it loses its legitimacy, but it loses its primacy in a way, you can now no longer be sort of, you're not talking to them directly and they're not talking to you or they're not, they're not sort of volunteering or involved in your discussion, right? Whereas, in apologia, they invariably are. You're getting family members, friends, just a whole army of people who, for whatever reason, are directly or indirectly involved. And that makes a big difference. You've got all those resources kind of at your disposal to tell your story. Number nine, in another clip of Jerry on the bus by the same cameraman, uh, it's cut off in the documentary right at the point where Jerry moans on camera that he's not on, he's not on holiday. Um, the cameraman actually points out on camera in the original footage, and there's a link to that, that Jerry sitting beside a row of kids appears to be sulking and needs to cheer up. This nifty editing is the first clear indication that the Netflix documentary means to distort footage so as to present the McCanns in a misleadingly flattering light. Number 10, an American woman's voice continues to to narrate the setup at the Ocean Club, which the subtitle of the documentary identifies as Robin. Robin Swan is the co-author with Anthony Summers of a neither here nor there investigation into uh, Madeleine McCann's disappearance. The description of the book Looking for Madeleine clearly matches the broader arc of the documentary, which is an investigation into the disappearance as some sort of sex trafficking spiel. The same book rated, well, that's quite interesting. When I wrote this post, it was rated um, 2.8 out of 5 on Amazon.com and 2.7 on Amazon.co.uk. So what's fascinating is right now, uh, Looking for Madeline is ranked 3.6 out of 5 on um, Amazon.com and uh, it's pretty much the same as it was um, before the Netflix documentary on um, Amazon.co.uk still at 2.7. So it's interesting that the American audience obviously have totally bought into the Netflix documentary and not only bought into the documentary, but bought this book, I guess, as a result of the documentary and um, have taken on the narrative wholesale. Uh, 
the book Looking for Madeline also maligns the Portuguese investigation into the McCanns, just as the McCanns themselves have done. So, in short, um, this book is apologia for the McCanns, whether, whether purposefully or not, whether they wrote it uh, for that purpose or whether that's their, their sincere beliefs. It um, basically um, defends the McCanns, right, in this, in this case. Um, number 11, next, the babysitting facilities of the Ocean Club are criticized as being inadequate. The McCanns felt it didn't suit them as they had to put them down too early and pick them up too late. So, of course, the McCanns elected to take care of the babysitting and put, putting uh, to bed themselves, which apparently involved each one, Kate and Jerry, doing an ongoing relay every half hour to check on them, along with the top of seven as well. Not only each night, but every night. So um, the uh, babysitting services didn't suit them. You know, it was too far to walk. It was too early, whatever. But what everybody agreed was much more convenient was for everybody to get up every half an hour from their meal uh, every night uh, and make several checks on the children um, for the entire holiday. And that was far more convenient to them. One can say with some certainty, had the McCanns made use of the babysitting services as deplorable as they supposedly were, uh, that every other family and that every other family seemed to be using, Madeline would not have been abducted. She wouldn't have wandered off. She wouldn't have been killed, sedated. Pick, pick your scenario. So, in other words, the other families that made use of these services, nothing happened to their children. Number 12, in my first analysis of the documentary, I noted how after Madeline's disappearance, the McCanns were only too happy to use the Kids Club creche facility. This is at the hotel where uh, Madeline was supposedly abducted. So Madeline's abducted. They don't use the creche facility. Right. And then. Sorry, I'm saying that in a way that's a little bit misleading. Um, they, they did use the daily creche facility. So during the day, um, the children did go to their respective kids clubs. I think Madeline went to a slightly older one compared to the children. Um, but the point being that um, after Madeline was supposedly abducted, right, the parents left the children uh, in these creches regardless. I'm talking about the younger children. Now, what's important to bear in mind is um, if you're criticizing these facilities as inadequate after the fact, then why would you leave your own children at these facilities? Uh, the photos taken of them there um, first thing each morning to drop them off. Uh, after the disappearance was, after all, how the paparazzi got their daily photo ops with the couple. Um, because of restrictions on YouTube and, you know, protections for children, I'm not going to be showing those images on YouTube, but you're welcome to go to the original blog post to look at the images captured by the paparazzi. Number 13, the authors then contextualize the various parts of the original crime scene. I like that they refer to the distance from the tapas bar to apartment 5A as 60 yards. Uh, I think that should be yards <laughs> as the crow flies. Um, I like that just because I used a raven in my thing and I had my raven flying from the tapas bar over everything back and forth. So, yeah, just another... Um, thing that I would notice, um, I don't expect anyone else to notice something like that. Um, number 14, the authors rationalize how the McCann set up a relay team with a top of seven. And this is what I played at the beginning of this clip. Where some of the parents would leave the restaurant midway through dinner and listen in on the various children in the various apartments. This is described as a better system than having all the kids together in a creche 
looked after by one person and thus allowing the couple to holiday the way most normal parents would. Of course, the doctors argue that their system is more normal and more sensible, which is why Madeline was completely safe and nothing happened to her. Dot, dot, dot. Number 15, the backstory of the crime is glossed over in the sense that the crucial days leading up to May 3rd aren't covered, nor any of the incidents that took place in this week. Nothing is mentioned at this point about the controversial last photo either, taken on the first day of the holiday. Instead, the coverage deals with the afternoon of May 3rd and the kids being particularly tired that day. By the way, that's also what was said about um, John Benet Ramsey. She was particularly tired and she just kind of went to bed and that was it. Um, they were particularly tired, so they would have slept particularly well that night, is the obvious but misleading inference. So that's 15 observations of roughly the first 10 to 15 minutes of episode 1. I think that's enough. It should be clear that much of the first episode is broadly supportive of the McCanns and even sympathetic to them. Bear in mind that I wrote this blog post after watching the first episode, not having watched all of them. Um, by green lighting the babysitting approach, the way is paid for some outsider, some shadowy interloper, to spoil the perfect fairy tale of perfect parenting. Of course, in a scenario where someone has to get up every 20 minutes, leave the restaurant and run around the apartments, we also have a scenario for one of the group disappearing for several minutes with or without a child in their arms and no one being any the wiser. Uh, in the next episode, T TCRS will be doing a similar analysis and review of episode two. One thing I just want to um, uh, highlight uh, in terms of the opening clip was you hear this narration about um, Jerry McCann getting up to check on Madeline and that happens so often in various documentaries and in their own uh, narrative. You hear the story about Jerry getting up, going to check on Madeline, but you, you never really get a solid idea of when he comes back. You never get a, a solid story of at this particular time, Jerry returns from checking and he's now back with the group. That is kind of um, a, a lot less certain. What you do sort of hear is that Jerry went to check and then he had conversations in the road with, with various people. And um, in one instance, Kate McCann does actually say, well, well, it took quite a long time. When he went to check on Madeline, it took quite a long time. Um, something else uh, mentioned by Jane Tanner in a reconstruction, and we'll get to that, is where she, she also said, you know, she kind of let slip on camera where um, she said something along the lines of, um, because you took a long time watching football or Kate was worried you were watching football. Um, but we will get to that in due course. For those interested in uh, my analysis, uh, you can go and check out Doubt on Amazon Kindle and, uh, and then the other series that's still at book one at this point, Deep Into Darkness. And uh, otherwise, I'll see you guys um, here again for episode two, dealing with um, the second episode in the series. Uh, in terms of Patreon, uh, you can also go and have a look at uh, another series debunking the Killing of John Bonet podcast. Um, episode two will be posted uh, later today as well. Thank you for listening.